Good morning. Thank you for coming. Thank you for joining us in the English service of the Korean Church in Singapore. We will be studying the book of Exodus as uh, being shared by both our deacon uh, Sean and our deacon Hannah for this entire month of April. And I'm delighted that we start from the very first chapter of Exodus. Well, the first chapter of any book gives us not just the setting of the book, but it usually gives us a heads up as to what is going to come in the rest of the book, the subsequent chapters. Some of you may recall that we actually have a movie night that we screened the movie Exodus about two years ago. How many of you actually remember that? Thank you. Well, um, about 15 years ago, probably more, I did not really check. There was an animated show, right, animated movie, The Prince of Egypt, with many memorable songs. Many of you were either too young, right, and may not have watched it, and some of you may not even be born at that time, well, I recommend you watch it after your mid-year exam in June. I'm sure you will like it, at least the song. Well, the book of Exodus actually carried one of the key themes of the will of God. Among the many, many stories that you may have been so familiar with, right, uh, maybe some of you can name a few, right, the Ten Plagues, the Passover, the um, so-called the uh, crossing of the Red Sea, the receiving of the Ten Commandments on the Mount Sinai. There's so many of them. And I'm here and so excited to wanted to share many of them with you. But I repeat, not the stories itself, because you are familiar with the story. You are familiar with the what. But I want to help you to draw out, draw out from the story, the will of God. Draw from the will, the story of God to understand what God really wants us to know and wants us to obey. But before we begin, let's come before the Lord first. Father God, thank you for leading your people out of Egypt 3,400 years ago and giving them and leading them to a place of rest in Canaan. Thank you for keeping this miraculous story for us, but more so, we ask that the Holy Spirit will give us understanding to know you and your will, that we may rejoice in you, obey your commandment, and delight in you. Speak, we are listening. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Amen. Well, allow me to first give you the context. As I say that I always like to start a book by reading and uh, the first chapter and be able to give you some background. This is the second book of the first five books written by Moses, right, which we commonly known as the Pentateuch, right, the Penta means five, and actually it is um, a continuation from the book of Genesis. Well, if you recall the Hebrew title of Genesis, who can remember the Hebrew title of Genesis? In the beginning, in the beginning, and the Hebrew title of Exodus is And these are the names And these are the names It starts with the word and A conjunction Right, so although in the ESV Bible We don't see the translation of the word and But in the Hebrew Bible Actually it starts with the word and These are the names For the grammarian amongst you You understand that but Exodus is actually taken out from the Greek word X, which is coming out, right? Hodos, which is the way, means coming out of the way, or they call it the way out, or simply, right? The Latin follow the Greek title, and subsequently we have the word Exodus by the of the title of this second book itself. And uh, to help you to remember, is the word acid, and so. I pray that actually every time you see the word acid, you remember the book of Exodus. You remember that God delivered the people of Jews, the Jewish people out of Egypt. And later on, I will tell you that God delivered more than just the Jews 
out of Egypt, God delivers all of us. Well, right, when, when did Exodus was being written? It was being written probably when they were wandering in the wilderness. Right, during the 40 years they were wandering under Moses himself. Right, and that is probably between his 80th birthday and the 120th birthday. Because Moses finally died at the age of 120 and he was so-called climb out of the Mount, Mount Nebo and across he looked into the land, the promised land that God has promised to Abraham. The promised land that God is going to lead his people, not just out of Egypt, but into the promised land, into a rest. So it was written some 3,400 years ago. The theme of Exodus delivered to worship God. Well, the uh, phrase, let my people go that they may serve me, or that they serve me, appears many, many times in the book of Exodus. In fact, if you have read your daily Bible, on Saturday you have read that in Exodus chapter 3 verse 12, chapter 3 verse 12 itself, that he already talked, Mo God spoke to Moses, let my people go, let my people go. When you, singular, that means Moses, God spoke to Moses, have brought the people out of Egypt, you, not Moses, plural, all the people, right, shall serve God on this mountain, shall serve God, shall worship God. So, well, in the English Bible, because of um, the English grammar of you, you can't tell whether it's a singular or plural, itself that the Hebrew Bible is very specific. In fact, I like Greek, so I know that Greek is just as specific, if not more specific, in terms of helping us to really understand. So, you shall serve God on this mountain. And the phrase, let my people go, have spoken many, many times, right? In Exodus chapter 7, verse 16, chapter 8, verse 1, verse 20, chapter 9, verse 1, verse 13, and chapter 10, verse 3. And the word worship and service is the same as far as God is concerned. So as this morning, you are worshipping God and you are rendering service to God Himself. We are serving Him. The main idea, I want us to remember that when we read through the 20, 22 verses in chapter 1, how are we able to summarize, how are we able to bring with us just one sentence itself? God fulfilled His promise of multiplying, of multiplying His people, giving them protection and covering amidst the persecution. The word multiplying that uh, many of you, that uh, I can't even point at uh, Caitlin, in fact, she is not only uh, uh, so-called in primary five right now, right, that um, we don't have anyone younger that probably in kindergarten or in primary one, they started to learn multiplication. You started to memorize the table of multiplication. But we are not talking about just a numerical multiplication. Not from the 70 to the 600 over 1,000 men, excluding the women. And so if you include the women and the children, by the time they leave, by the time they left Egypt, it was a contingent of 2 million people dead about. 2 million people. And so if you imagine that if you have five in a row, you probably take about 30 over miles before they can finish crossing. But of course, we all know from the movie itself, they realize that there is no way they can cross only in a contingent of five crossing the Red Sea. They probably about one to two miles breath crossing over, crossing over. But I want you to sort of emphasize the point that the multiplying is more than just the physical or numerical multiplication. But it is actually, eventually you read through the whole book, it's talking about the spiritual multiplication, the spiritual maturity of the people. God eventually will be giving His people the Ten Commandments so as to teach them to obey, teach them how to live ethically, more on this in the second half of Exodus. 
right? Which um, if the Lord is willing, we probably will be covering that in the month of September this year, because we are only going to cover the first 17, 18 chapters in this coming three weeks itself. Structure of chapter one that I have sort of uh, entitled it and multiplied in Egypt from verses one to seven. Multiplied while they were in slavery. Verses 8 to 14. And multiply while they were in false eradication. And these are the names. These are the names. Right? Of the sons of Israel who came to Egypt with Jacob, each with his whole household. And if you have your Bible in front of you, which, uh, or if you have your daily Bible with you, you'll find that it has listed a list of names, but in a very strange order. Maybe later on that uh, you will discover that in the interest of time, I'm not going to tell you why the list of names is being written in this order, which is slightly different in the birth order, right? which is covered in Genesis itself. Right? Reuben, Simeon, Levi, Judah. Sons of Levi, sons of Leah, and then after that, Benjamin, Benjamin, right? Then after Issachar and Zebulun, and then finally they come to the handmaiden of Jacob itself. That the other four name, and then they say that Joseph, who was already in Egypt, seventy of them, seventy of them, which um, you can basically able to find there are many way that to try to count the number of 70 and in Genesis they talk about 66 right and then because they discounted that uh, Joseph was already there so they and Jacob was obviously not the descendant of Jacob so you add Jacob himself in so there are 70 of them that uh, went over to Egypt itself they were fruitful and increased greatly And increase greatly. God promised Abraham in chapter Genesis 15, verse 13. Then the Lord said to Abraham, or Abraham at that time is known, known know for certain that your offspring, God is talking to Abraham, your offspring will be sojourners, will be immigrant, will be alien in a land that is not theirs in Egypt. And they will be servants there. And they will be afflicted for 400 years. But I will bring judgment on the nation that they serve, Egypt. And afterward, they shall come out with great possession. God already foretold to Abraham, promised Abraham, your descendants will be like stars in the heaven. But they will, at first, the first, they will be enslaved in a foreign land. And after that, they will come out. They say that before Abraham gave birth to Isaac, before Isaac gave birth to Jacob, and before Jacob and his children, his 12 sons. And then, just when a famine, the seven years famine, for those of you who remember the great story of Joseph, right? That you know that at that time, there were seven years of famine. And after the first two years, the entire family, Jacob, knew that his son Joseph did not die. And in fact, the son Joseph was now become the so-called, the number two man, the prime minister in the land of Egypt. Yes, it was a land that was also suffering under famine, but they were prepared because God had first given the dream and the understanding of the dream to Joseph. So Jacob has to make a decision. Should I go down with my family? Migrating the whole family is a big matter because not just his family, but also the sheep and everything that they ever have. And God revealed to Jacob, say, I am God, the God of your father. Do not be afraid to go down to Egypt, for there I will make you into a great nation. God telling Jacob, yes, you can go down. But before that, you do know that God actually told Abraham, 
don't go down to Egypt because you will be corrupted by the people there. But now God said to, 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 to Jacob, yes, you can go down. I will multiply you there and then I will bring you out. And if Jacob have understood from his grandfather, Abraham, he will knew that his people will eventually become enslaved there, but God will bring them out. That were the promise. That were the promise that Jacob will be holding in his hand. So these are the two verses that I just wanted to share that with you, right? That they will be sojourners, they will be servants there, they will serve there for 400 years, but they shall come out. They shall come out. This is the promise that God gave to Abraham. And another verse, God gave to Jacob. You can go down. I will make you into a great nation. I myself will go down with you and I will bring you back up again. It's wonderful promises that the people should have hold into their hand. But when they were suffering later on, you know that have they forgotten? Have they forgotten the promise of God? So the three points. Multiply in slavery. The second point. Multiply in slavery. There arose a new king over Egypt who did not know Joseph. Who was this new king? So the Bible scholar is trying to sort of align the timing and so on. Because you know why? There wasn't the same record in the Egyptian right chronicles. In the Egyptian history, they couldn't find this exodus the occurrence in the Egyptian history. Why? Obviously. Because how could they record something that for nearly 2 million of people, the Jewish people, have exodus, have exit out of the land. And the soldiers, their own soldiers, which was supposed to be the, right, the superpower at that time, drowned into the sea. So there was no record. Right, so it's a bit difficult to align between the Bible record and the extra biblical record itself. So there were scholars saying that it probably, right, referring to first, right, that when Joseph was there under the so called the 17th dynasty, right, by the people of Hyksos, which is they themselves are foreigners, they conquered Egypt and therefore they were kind to the, the Jews themselves because they were foreigners. And then a new king which the local people eventually have so-called regained their land and therefore they would never want to be kind to foreigners, including the Jewish people. But, well, that is probably not the most important point, but this new king probably would have been at least 300 years ever since Joseph was there. So some say about 340 years, the Jewish people began to be enslaved and therefore, they, this new king did not know Joseph and he was frightened of them because they managed to kick the Hyksos out if those record was correct and they were worried that if they are being attacked again the Jewish people counted as 600,000 men and if you based on 10,000 is one division in today's world 600,000 means 60 division of men men that is able to fight will be sort of internally align themselves with the external forces. So the Egyptian king said, no, 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 I better think of a way, lest they multiply, lest they multiply. The fear of immigrants is not new. I think today that many nations are still fearful of the immigrants. So they put the Israelites under slavery hoping that to labor, put them into slavery and they have to work day and night, they will not be able to rest and therefore they will not be able to multiply. But the Israelites multiply. The Israelites multiply. But the more they were oppressed, the more they multiply and the more they spread abroad and the Egyptians were in dread of the people of Israel. Well, this is the place, Goshan. You read about it in Genesis. A fertile land, a land that is very good for shepherding their sheep itself, right? And they helped, they were being made to slave, they helped to build cities, store cities in Ramses, Ramesses and 
the pitam in Egypt itself, but not pyramid. Just in case anyone will tell you that, oh, the Egyptian make the Jewish people to build their pyramid. No, pyramid were built long way before, right? The Jewish people, so, so called, or Jacob moved into Egypt itself and before they multiplied. But they did build the store cities themselves for the Egyptian. And the third point, multiply in false eradication. So, Pharaoh say, if I make them a slave, work them day and night so that they will not have time to rest, they will not be able to multiply, and they still multiply, let me come out another two plans. Plan A, kill the baby boys. Wow, I admired uh, our sister Kitlin, realized that it is not kill all the babies, but only kill the baby boys at birth. And then there were two midwives. Their name, because they have done what was correct in the sight of God. They fear God, right? Shipra and Puah. And God gave them their own family. They so-called disobey the law of the land. So does that mean that God so-called bless the people not obeying the government, the law of the government? No, no, no. They, God bless them because they fear God. There was a higher order. The higher order is to obey God. And this actually was being covered in a lot more recent in Acts. When I say recent, it's still 2,000 years ago. When Jesus' disciples Right, were being told not to preach the gospel, they disobey. They continue to preach. They continue to pray. Not the order to be removed, but they pray that they will have bonus. So Shipra and Puau have the bonus, have the courage to disobey the law of Pharaoh. They fear God and did not do as the king commanded. So the Israelites continue to multiply. The third time, the same word, the key word of the entire chapter 1, multiply, multiplied, multiplied. They continue to multiply. And then Pharaoh say, okay, I'm going to have the plan B. The plan B is to cast the baby boys into the river now. Since there is no way to kill the baby before, right at birth, so the next step is, even after they have been given birth, they will continue to kill the baby so that the nation will be exterminated. But that is where the time that in chapter 2, the people started to cry out to God to deliver them. That was when a woman, the mother of Moses, so-called partially obey the law of the government he, she did cast baby Moses into the river now. But before that, she built a so-called, whether you call it a boat or a basket, right, that is able to float. And Moses will be discovered by the daughter of Pharaoh. But So what are the lessons? Now that I have given you the same story that any Sunday school has given to you, I want you to understand the story is first, God fulfilled His promises. And His promises is that they will be multiplied. Regardless of what man may do, they will be multiplied. God is always faithful. God keep His word and fulfill His promises. We can trust Him. His word will never return to Him void. He promised Abraham. He promised Jacob. Do bear in mind the aspect of spiritual multiplication as we continue to study the book of Exodus. But they will also be protected amidst all the persecution. Nothing we are experiencing in this world will catch God by surprises. Who were at fault? Were the Israelites at fault? The famine was only seven years. On the second year, Jacob and his family moved down to Egypt. Shouldn't they have returned after the famine was over? After all, they all knew that the land of Canaan was a promised land. 
But how come they did not remember to go back? They didn't want to go back. The Bible did not sort of give us the so-called explanation. But if you read in between the line, if you look at just now the map, the land of Egypt was really good. It was really good for them at that time. They have the so-called man in power. Joseph was the number two man. So they have connection. They were blessed. And because of that, they could have. Right? Many, many scholars, including myself, when I read this, is why didn't they return after the famine was over? That means five more years. All returned. Right? The material blessings that they experienced in Jacob maybe so-called blinded them. God protects them even in the midst of persecution. Similarly, as our deacon Hannah have shared, last week we celebrated the resurrection of our Lord Jesus Christ. And when he was dying on the cross, he delivered not just the Jewish people, all the people that believe in him have been delivered out of the slavery of Satan. Jesus is the type of Moses, delivering us from the bondage and the slavery of Satan. And in Hebrew chapter 2, verse 14, Since therefore the children share in flesh and blood, he himself, Jesus Christ, partook of the same things, that through death he might destroy the one who has the power of death, that is the devil, and deliver all those who through fear of death were subject to lifelong slavery. So Jesus did a greater thing than Moses. Jesus delivered us, not from just a pharaoh, an Egyptian king, delivered all of us from the slavery of Satan. You and I are now saved, have been delivered. We know the purpose. We are delivered to serve Him. We are delivered to worship Him. Yet, because we are followers of Jesus, Satan is not going to let the Jewish people, not going to let us to have an easy life. In John chapter 16, verse 33, Jesus told us, I have said these things to you, Jesus said, that in me you may have peace. In the world you will have tribulation. But take heart, I have overcome the world. But the mystery of God is this, that even when we were being delivered, it is not a bed of roses. We are all experiencing different types of so-called discomfort, if I may not want to use the word persecution. But these are the works of the Satan that continue not letting us go. But we are to turn and to continue to focus on the one that is drawing us out and to remember his promise and to remember that we are being delivered is to worship him. So how should we live? Fear God and live. Fear God and live. So now I always tell you that many a times that if you want to walk out of this room afterward, just remember the action item, the application is to fear God and live. We are still in the midst of COVID-19. How shall we live? Fear God and live. This is the what, but how? By rooted in His words. In order for us to be sure that we can fear Him and live, we have to first know His word, know His promises, and to know that we are to cry out to Him if we encounter the persecution of the evil one. Second, be patient with His timing. Every time when we cry out to God and then we find that we are still struggling, then we say, God, where are you? Where are you? God has His timing. Fear God and live by be patient. Be patient of His timing. And finally, serve while you are waiting, while you are still going through the discomfort, the oppression of the evil one. Serve. Worship Him while you are waiting. Continue to serve God while waiting for His deliverance. 
Yes, we have been delivered, but we continue just like the Jewish people. They still go through the 40 years in the wilderness. They still have to conquer the, the, the land of the promised land. They didn't go through a walkover. Yes, in a way, but they will still see a lot of giants and they have to overcome their own fear of the world by fearing God is the one. So with this, I want to end with this reflection question. Am I living a multiplying life? Am I living a life of spiritual maturity, spiritual multiplication? That is the theme. Fear God and live, and you will multiply. You will grow in maturity spiritually. And you will be stronger in the faith of God. Thank you.